Good morning, Riverbend family. That's the model right there. That's the example. Good morning, Riverbend family. Awesome. You guys are great. Good to see you this morning. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Amen. Well, here we are. I got a couple announcements to give to you today uh, before we begin. A season of giving campaign. We're at 53% of our goal. That's amazing. So continue. Thank you. Yes. See the example right there. Um, continue to seek the Lord as to how you may be involved in that and if the Lord would have you to contribute there. We have a lot of special events headed your way here pretty soon. Details will all be in the publications of the church. The R mail, the bulletins, you go to the website or our app. We've got classes for the Bible College. We've got a Riverbend Academy Benefit Golf Tournament coming up at the end of this month on October 27th. Food collections for Thanksgiving baskets. That is right around the corner. Can you believe it? And then Fall Fellowship on November 12th. So keep looking Looking for more information there. Now, I do have a very special announcement today. And staff, if you're in here, you've probably heard this. So if it sounds a little familiar, you'll know why. You know, when we bring announcements, some bring great joy and we're really excited and pumped up. Some bring some sadness. And there are some announcements that bring kind of a mixed bag of emotions. Well, last Wednesday, uh, Troy Dittman asked the elders to meet with him after service and he informed us that he accepted a position as a technical director for a church in Oklahoma. His three-week notice of resignation was effective as of that Wednesday. Now, because of this, we felt that it was important to let you, our church family, know as soon as possible. We'll have some more things for Troy on his last day. We're going to have some, uh, we're going to give him a gift and, and whatnot. We're just going to honor him well. But we wanted to give you this information because on one hand, and we said it was a mixed bag of emotions. On the one hand, I am really happy for Troy. He described for us how we sought and discovered God's will in this matter. And the process and the prayer that he and Shelby went through demonstrated their love and devotion for Christ and his church. And you should talk to them about it. It's a great example of how to seek God's specific will when you're unsure. They're really godly people. And they're both convinced that this is what God wants for them. So we're overjoyed for them. But yet, we can't also but help uh, to feel a little bit of sadness. Now, I consider Troy not only a dear brother in Christ, but a dear friend. Most of you may not know Troy very much, except for the booming voice that comes from the tech booth, or maybe seeing him fast walking around the, the building to make sure things get done. But the more anyone comes to get to know him, the more you'll come to admire him. He has the strongest work ethic of anybody I know. He'll give you the shirt off his back without a thought if you needed it. He serves as our tech director running sound and video, video editing for our church, the academy, for the Bible college and seminary. He's our facilities point person for repairs and installs and setup. Nobody knows this building like Troy does. And he also helps us with IT and networking. Now, even though I'm confident that God will provide for us here at Riverbend, he operates in so many roles that his presence will be felt. So... Take some time to process this information and this announcement, but make sure you congratulate Troy and Shelby, what would be a new amazing chapter of their lives in service to Christ. And that's what they want to do, is just serve Christ. So if you can give a hand for Troy and Shelby right now. Amen. I'm going to read Psalm chapter 147 as we begin our service today, and then I'll pray and we'll begin to worship. God's word says, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is becoming. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. The Lord supports the afflicted. He brings down the wicked to the ground. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Let's do that this morning. Father, we thank you that you are all those things and more. You are the great and awesome God of all creation, knowing the stars and giving them names. And yet you know us so well that you bind up the brokenhearted that you redeem us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is man that you are mindful of him? Best you are. And we're so thankful. And that's why we're here. Because you're mindful of us. So we need to be mindful of you. Mm -hmm. 
I pray that your spirit will enable us to do that today and give you an offering of worship and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 What a great and mighty God we serve. Church, why don't you stand on your feet and let's worship the Lord this morning. Trust Him when to 
Right, church? Amen. The 
spinning world by your own hand hurls ever on around the sun the seasons march at your command the old departs the new year comes and though celestial is your gaze you search and care for Zealous youth and cautious age Determine not the steps we choose Great shepherd guide us through each day Oh how we want to follow you Come laying way our way make clear That perfect love drive us Winter makes us reminisce of warmer days so distant now, of cherished saints the sun once kissed, whose beauty passed behind the clouds. Let all our fond and longing tears remind us we are pilgrims here. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving in God. to age 
in confidence church oh God you're so good yes he is God you're so good God you're so good you're so good to Let's sing this chorus one more time. Oh God, you're so good. Yes, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to Good morning, church family. Uh, we are entering into our time of worship through giving this morning. And the, the Lord is faithful to tailor His church through its seasons. Isn't that biblical? We have great confidence in that. And every good work He places on our hearts. Amen? And just like every good work, He gives us a heart for giving. And I don't get to say this very often. Um, and sometimes as a staff member, it gets... Interesting to bring these topics up, but I'm, I'm glad that Laura and I get to partner with you in giving toward the furtherance of the gospel ministry through this church. We get to link arms together in these things. And just like every good work in the church, none of these things should fall on just a handful of people. So I don't encourage us all to consider what we may give this morning to the glory of our Savior. There's multiple ways that we can give this morning. The baskets will be passed. We have our receptacles on the walls we can give online. Let's be faithful to give. And I have the opportunity to read our text this morning. It comes from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. Hear the word of the Lord. 
If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a while, while the world After a while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him and will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You may be seated. Let us pray as we prepare to give this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for the many provisions that you give us. We're very grateful for your sacrifice on the cross. We find our identity with you in your death and in your life. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of faith to trust and to believe and to follow according to your will. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit who is at work within us and through us. Lord, help us to be active in this gospel age, not clinging to the things of this world, but to even be willing to lay down our lives for another. Give us hearts and minds to hear and to receive your word today. And Lord, grow our capacity to worship you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine What a great set of music today. Uh, tune our hearts to the Lord. Good to see you this morning. Uh, boy, uh, <laughs> I do, do love Troy. He has become a dear friend through these years. And I think what I appreciate the most is as he was sharing with us the detail and trying to find the will of God. Um, a lot of times we'll make moves or take changes because of circumstances push us, and the Lord certainly uses those. But as Christians, we are seeking to find the center of God's will. And that takes effort and dying to ourself, and uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Troy's been such a blessing. I remember Shelby, um, <laughs> uh, I worked very hard to make sure when I first got here, I didn't call her Shelly. Um, and I called, I said, hi, Shelby, how are you? She goes, you got my name right. <laughs> and uh, what a blessing. Of course, their girls have been a blessing to us as well, and uh, we praise the Lord for them. I took the last week off, and we went out west and visited one of our sons, and uh, a lot of prayer, a lot of time to kind of think of where the Lord was putting on, what he was putting on my heart, where to go. And I think eventually I'm going to end up in the book of First Thessalonians. But I, I want to spend some time just preaching on things that are on my heart, direction, and uh, love for the church, uh, love for one another, those type of things. And, of course, as I was studying all of that, um, the whole world came undone last weekend, it seems, doesn't it? Um, awful awful things took place in the Middle East. And so that began to capture my mind a little bit. And a lot of the things we've been discussing as we finished 1 Corinthians was that love for Christ, that love for his word, and that love for one another. And that made me think of why the religions of the world all end in death. Do you understand that? All of the religions of the world end in death. Only... Life in the Lord Jesus Christ through his finished work ends in life, eternal life. And as I began to think about that, I thought, Lord, where did everything go awry? I thought I'd just take a moment just for opening because I think this will help us learn to understand what it means to love Christ. What's the difference in us? What does it mean to love Christ with all your heart and all your soul and all your might? What is the difference in that than us? And then the rest of the religions of the world. Well, it is rejection. It's a rejection of God. It's a rejection of his word. And it's a rejection of his son. Let me start with you in Genesis chapter 17. I think many Americans and sadly I think many Christians don't understand where Islam left the truth. And what motivates and what's behind it. Muhammad came in 600s and had demonic dreams that were just completely anti-God, anti-Christ. And he led a great many people astray, and to this day, that is still happening. But as they looked at the Bible, there became a very quick separation from God's word. And there are several places that we find key in here, but Genesis 17 is probably one that we want to note. This is where Islam and the Muslim faith would have deterred, and they no longer look to the Scriptures after verses like this. Genesis chapter 17, let me start in verse 18. Seeing as Abraham is certainly come to faith, we know in chapter 15 he comes out of his tent and he believes in what he cannot see, and God credits that to righteousness. That's mentioned there. It's mentioned in the New Testament. Certainly a time where we believe Abraham came to faith, but he was still struggling to figure out how God was going to fulfill these promises, make a great nation out of him when he couldn't even impregnate his wife. In times, he turns to alternatives and suggests other things. And so in verse 18, notice Abraham said to God, he's speaking with God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. 
See, this was his alternative. Take the child of sin and create something out of him. God's words are so clear, aren't they? Look at verse 19. And let me just read the first four words for impact. But God said no. This is where they depart. In Islam, they think that Ishmael is rightful heir to all the covenant promises. But God said no. Do you see that? Do you see how clear that is in the text? And then he reminds them, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly, and he shall become the father of twelve princesses. That's really interesting. You might be hearing some of that in the news. And I will make him a great nation. He certainly has. Is, uh, Ishmael is great today. He's in lots of different tribes, lots of different power in the Middle East. He is certainly great. Verse 21, conjunction. But, that's so clear. My covenant, God speaking here, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. This is where it departs. And this is where war and hatred and murder and has been happening for a very, very long time. And will still, even as we watch Jacob and Esau and their relationship deteriorate over the birthright, we see when they come together, there was great fear from Jacob to Esau. And that becomes a problem all the way through as you walk through the Bible. If you're with us on Wednesday nights, and we've already seen Israel come up against Edom once. They'll come up against them many, many more times. Edom is part of this bearing of princesses from Ishmael. But then you say, so Scott, what about the Jews? Well, their story is about two-thirds of the Bible, and I think that's important to remember. But they too rejected God's word. And I want to go to the New Testament and give Christ the authority here. Go to John chapter 5. And here we will see the central problem. We know their rejection of God, their turning to idols, their uh, judgment that sent them into captivity. They still, in a sense, are under that judgment hand of God. They have moved from nation to nation underneath them from the time of the end of Jerusalem and Daniel and all of that. Even to this day, they are under the disciplined hand of God. But here was their main problem. John chapter 5, verse 37. Jesus speaking here says, And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. Now here's the problem. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. He's the indivisible God. I am the visible God. I'm everything he is. You want to see him? You see me. He goes on to say, you do not have his word abiding in you. That abiding word is very important. We'll come back to that this morning. For you do not believe him whom he sent. There is the problem with the religions of the world. They reject Jesus as God. They reject the equality of Jesus with the Son. Jesus said, why are you stoning me? For my good works. He said, they said, no, we don't stone you for your good works because you made yourself out to be God. At least they got the message right. Though they did not believe it. Instead, the nation of Israel has done this. Verse 39, Jesus saying, again, you search the scriptures because you think in them you will have eternal life. So instead of turning to Jesus, who is the final lamb, that, that the tabernacle was center of their worship, Jesus Christ is that final lamb who comes. Instead of turning to him, they search the Bible to find the do's and don'ts in order to inherit the kingdom of God. But Jesus says, you are greatly mistaken. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. 
I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, in that you do not, listen to this, have the love of God in yourself. And so over there you have the descendants of Ishmael up against the descendants of Abraham. Both have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way. And you have a great clash. These certainly are promises the Bible has told us would happen, and they are happening. But this does not leave out the rest of man. Look at Romans chapter 3 with me. After Paul has done such a great job to show that all are under sin, doesn't matter what type of sin, what area you have been in, maybe the, I, I often refer to this as the low class center, the middle class center, and the high class center. The low class, just completely rejection of God who's made himself known. Middle class, oh, that's bad, but does things behind the scene. And then the high class center, the religious person who's out there living one life, but his heart is far from God. Paul has shown that all are sinners. Look at verse 9 with me in chapter 3 of Romans. What then are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. What are the wages of sin? You seeing that pretty much today? It goes on, it is written, as he begins to unfold many passages out of the Old Testament. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understand. There is none who seek God. All have turned aside, turned together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poisons of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path. In the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. See, all religions of the world try to get themselves to a God in some way based on their own righteous deeds. And they will justify those deeds to the nth degree because all of their hope is getting themselves to God. Not Christians. Not the true Christians. The true Christian knows that we have no hope on our own. Our rags are but filthy, our our works are but filthy rags. They They are stained and soiled and nothing you would ever want to offer the king. We come to him through Jesus alone. There's no other way. And this war against God will soon turn itself towards those who stand only on Christ alone. But what is a true Christian? How do you you recognize it? Well, I think that's what we've been talking about, that true Christian loves Jesus, and loves his word. Uh, They they love his people. And this morning I want to focus on what it means to love Christ because in this passage that Aaron read for us really helps us understand the, the person who loves Christ and the result, what comes from that person's life when you love him. And it's a good challenge. It's a good challenge to look at it, to say, do I truly love Jesus? Because what you're seeing over there is not a love for Jesus. What you're seeing in this world, what you're seeing on TV, what you see constantly around us. That's why Jesus says, don't be in, don't be of the world. You have to be in it, but don't be of it, because it does not love Jesus. But do you? Do you? So this morning, I want to focus on what it means to love Christ. What is the Father's role in our love for Christ? How does he help us in that? What is produced from loving Christ? And what does the Father promise us when we love his Son? What does he promise us? There's so much in this passage we'll unpack this morning. And uh, I pray that you'll come away encouraged. Number one, the Father's unique love for his children produces eternal love for his son. Well, Jesus makes it overtly clear in these verses that the gifts he promises to us here are not for the world. They are for a limited people. And 
by a larger study of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, we understand that the gifts and all that is given here is reserved for those and those alone who love him, whom he himself, God himself, draws to himself apart from us. That's what the text teaches. I think another way to say this is the love that Jesus promises us here is not a love that he and the Father have for the world. That's a hard one for people to hear. We are not all God's children. God does not love the world like he loves us. And I know your mind, you walk to John 3.16, so many people do, for God so loved the world, his creation. I think there's a stark difference here. He does love his creation. He loves them uniquely, and he shows it daily by giving them life, right? The sun did come up out of the east again today. Rain does come. He, he does not let Adam separate. He holds all things together so that even wicked men who curse him and do the evil atrocities that we've seen still have life and breath. God does love the world. But he has a unique love for his people. The verse goes on to say that he gave up his only begotten son, that whoever, that has to be the elect. It has to be. It just cannot be some scattering, oh, do your best and get to me. It has to be this directive, whoever that is. I'm so glad he uses that word, even though it gets beat up so often, because it tells us that that we don't know who God's drawn. But those he does, they believe in him. They believe in Jesus. And because they believe in Jesus and they love Jesus, they won't perish, but they'll have eternal life. There is no greater love than that. Now, there's a love here that carries gifts with it. And God reserves those gifts for his own. Just briefly look as Aaron read to us as you get back to John, excuse me, John chapter 14 here. I'm not even there. John 14. Keep your finger here. I'm just going to be working in and out of these verses this morning. Look at 16 and 17. These are gifts God reserves for his own. We just briefly, we'll come back and look at this. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. What a beautiful gift. Verse 17, that the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. There it is. There's a distinction, right? Because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides in you and will be with you. Verse 19. After a little while, the world will, not, will no longer see me. But you will see me because I live and you will live also. Drop down to verse 23. Jesus said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we <laughs> will come to that one who loves me, to him, and make our abode with him. Notice the love of God shown in every one of those verses distinctly for those who love Jesus. Not for the rest of the world. And you can see that from these verses. There's a gift of intimacy here. There's a gift of relationship. There's a gift of help. There's a gift of love. These all have promises that the world is not going to have. That's why we have what we have out there. They know not the love of God. This is why we don't react that way. Because we have experienced the love of God, but the world does not. And what is promised here is something so personal, so so intimate, so shared with the Godhead, so relational that you can at any moment, at any time, as a Christian, day, night, no matter where you're at, call upon a God who loves you and listens to you. It's an intimate relationship. Paul often spoke of this, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, for this is what we labor and strive for. This is what he wants people to understand and know because we fix our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men. He saves people every day from themselves, but especially for the believer. Special relationship you have with God if you're saved through Jesus Christ alone. If you're not saved through Jesus Christ alone, you have no relationship with God. And it is only by a moral restraint that God puts on your heart that you don't do what you see done out there. But that'll end. Second thought this morning. How does the Father's love affect his children? 
Well, those who receive these gifts we've spoken about already, these promises, this, this incredible intimate love with the Father, are not simply called Christians or believers. I want you to notice they are called people who love Jesus. Remember I said, love Christ, love his word, love his people. So, so look at this with me. Look in verse 15. He, I think he says it about four times in this text. If you love me. So, so you're referred to as lovers of Jesus. You, you're not in any other way. You have to love Jesus. This is why this is so paramount. People go, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, great, great. No, no. <laughs> you love him. You lay your life down for him. See, verse 15, if you love me. Notice further in verse 21. He who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. See, see Christian, you're recognized by your love for Jesus. That's, that's, how, that's how you're known. You love Jesus. Certainly you love his word and you love his people. We'll get to that in time. But you love Jesus. Drop down to verse 23. For two more times he tells us, Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, there it is, you love me. He will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode in him. You love me. See, that's how we know God has changed our lives. We love Jesus. You look at all the religions of the world. There is no love, eternal, God-given love for Jesus. He's a good man. He's a prophet. He might have been a historical character. Yeah, he's a good example for us to follow. They don't love him. Because that love has to come from the Father. See, this is a love the true believers receive from God himself for his son. It's different from the love that God has for the world. It's, it's different. He has, he, he has a love for us that's unique, and he gives us this personal, intimate, relational, affectionate, committed love that the Father gives for us so we can love Jesus. And the Father's love causes the true believer to love Jesus. That's the result of it. That's, that's the result is the commands and the loving his word and loving one another. That all starts from the Father's generated love that he creates deep within us a love for his son. How does, how does the love of the father affect his children? Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, that's what we're called, we're called lovers of Jesus, truly loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Paul picks up in this, Romans 5, 8, God shows or displays his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, so how's the Father going to love us? He sends his Son to die for us when we don't deserve it, when we have no ability to love him back. He loves us first. And that's what John picks up and says, look, we don't love him first. He loved us first. So God didn't wait for us to come around to love him or love his Son. He loves us first. And that love of God loving us generates a love for his son. Your love for Jesus is a work of God, not a work of yourself. You don't wake up someday and say, I'm just going to love Jesus. There's no way we can break the stranglehold of love of ourselves. The Father's got to do that. Now, here's another marvelous truth. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. In other words, God, God's love grants and enables our love. And, and notice that God responds to our love for his Son and loves us uniquely and personally and intimately and affectionately and caring in a committed love because we now belong to him through his son. It's the only, it is the only one who, it's only, only the one who loves Christ who has been loved by the Father. Look at chapter 16. He, he reiterates this several times. Now remember, this is all happening just 
right before his death. This, this is in the long passage of John that's recording from chapter 12. After he speaks his last public message, he goes into seclusion. The last week of his life, there's so much given here. He's given now days and moments before his own death. Remember, this has all taken place. Go to chapter 16, verse 27. Jesus says to his disciples, because we are disciples of the disciples in a sense, the Father himself loves you. I think you can take this personally. Because you have loved me. You see that? The Father loves you because you've loved me. So there's this incredible play on words throughout Jesus Christ because the Father will give you love to help you love me. And when you love me, you'll love the Father. And I'll help you love the Father. And the Father will help you love me. And there's this beautiful relationship we're caught in between the Father and Son and his love. It's overwhelming, isn't it? For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Notice verse seven, chapter 17, verse 23. I in them and you in me that they may be perfect in unity so that the world may know that you sent me. I love them. (laughs) Do you feel loved today by the Trinity? (laughs) I hope you do, Christian. The Father, we haven't gotten into spirit yet. We're going to get to him in a minute. The the Father loves you. The Son loves you. Loving the Son generates a love for the Father. Loving the Father generates a love for the Son. Now, There's a sad reality when we think of our family members that don't know Jesus, things we're seeing in the Middle East. The reality is the lost. There are people who do not love Jesus, and so they do not love the Father. Jesus made that clear. If you don't love me, you don't love the Father. And so in John 5, 23, here's what he says. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent me. He constantly, John, John, everybody loves to read the book of John, and I love it too. I tell people to read the book of John all the time. But it is a masterpiece on the equality of the Father and the Son. You dishonor the Father, you dishonor me. You don't love me, you don't love the Father. In fact, he goes on to say it very clearly in John 15, 23, the, verses, uh, the next chapter past, he says, he who hates me hates my Father also. That's an amazing thing. There's such a uniqueness of the love the Father and the Son have together. It's so different than our love. Like, I had four brothers. We fought like cats and dogs. You know, we were athletes. We were always competition. Always, you would go, man, those guys don't like each other. Oh, come between us. (laughs) And you get all of them. (laughs) But it's not a a perfect love, is it, right? We can't love each other, but you get in my way, or if I hurt my little brother, we're going to come and pound you. Oh, no, no. God's love is so different than that. Oh, God's love is so beautiful. But for those who just say, well, I love Jesus, but I reject his word, I reject God's plan, they find themselves in hatred against the Almighty God no matter what they say. See, no one rejects the Lord Jesus Christ can truly know, love, and honor God because the Father loves the Son And the love of the Father is what creates and generates a love for his Son in our lives. So this is the effect of the Father's love. The promises in these verses are not for the world. They can't see them. They can't know them. They can't grasp them. They can't experience them. They are for those who love Jesus alone. That's what makes us so different, brothers and sisters. That's what often makes us a target, though. Because we love Jesus and we don't love this world. We love our Savior. Third thought, what does it mean to love Jesus? What does it mean to love Jesus? Well, Jesus tells us at least those four times we saw in there that this love is, is such a, a natural result of, of obeying him, right? Verse 15, look with me. If you love me, what's the result? You'll keep my commandments. Notice verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. He just reverses it, right? Same thing. There's a result here. So what does it mean to love Jesus? Will you love him? You you obey him. 
You keep his commandments. You keep his word. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he keeps my word. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. There's the negative aspect of it. So the key, the first thing to notice here is that loving Jesus is not the same as keeping the commandments. That's a big mistake. People say, well, I did this and I didn't do that and I did that and I did that. That's not the same as loving Jesus. That's legalism. That could find yourself in hell because of those things. Lord, I've done all these things from my youth. Well, sell everything and follow me. Whoa, wait a minute. Now you're talking about a deeper love than I'm ready to commit to. See, see the difference? And you see where so many religions of the world have tried, even fringe Christianity and even, ooh, pressing into Christianity right now is, hey, I do all these things, you give me back my love. I think there's a unique love that proceeds from the Father and it produces, listen to this, a desire to keep his word. Why do you obey Jesus? Because you were raised in church? Ooh, that's a hot, hot return. Why do you love Jesus? Is it because the fathers loved you? He opened your blind eyes and your hard heart. He took out that heart of flesh and heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh so you could love him. Is that why you love him? Or you love him because you have this list that makes you feel better? So I think that's where so many people go awry. Keeping his word is a result of loving him. Not the same. It's not the same as just loving him. Oh, I just love him, right? People say today, oh, I love Jesus. Well, what do you think about gender, marriage, and all that God says about the family? Well, well yeah, I, I don't agree with that. Well, wait a minute. So you don't want to obey him? I mean, think about this, where this goes. Unequally yoked with people in deep relationships with somebody that you know is not in Christ. The way we handle our money, our marriages, all those type of things. I mean, think about that. Do you love me? And is the result of this God-given love that now you're saying you love Jesus, is there a desire to follow his will? You, me, and every Christian has to answer that question every once in a while. Because otherwise we just kind of skate along and go, hey, I was at church twice this week. Verse 15, if you love me, the results will be you'll keep my commandments. Verse 23, if you love me, the results will be you'll keep my word. So what is this love for Jesus that produces such a desire? Let's think about that. Think about Jesus, right? He has, he has no blemish. He has no sin. He's, he's holy. He's, he has no deficiency, deficiencies, Right? He, he, he's free of sin. He's holy. So, so how are you going to love him? Are you going to say, well, God, I, I just love your son. Isn't it gracious of me to love Jesus? No, it's not gracious of you to love Jesus. He doesn't need your grace. He's sinless. We need the loving grace of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. See, it's a whole different relationship with him. We, we don't dare love him the same way he loves us. Right? It's a different love. That's why, listen, that's why it has to come from the Father. Think about that. I love Gina, but we're both sinners. And that can make things challenging. Amen? People are married at times, right? Got to do some work, a lot of grace and forgiving one another, right? That isn't what we do with Jesus. There's absolutely nothing to forgive with Jesus. We don't come to him that way. Oh, we love Jesus entirely deserved love. His love is entirely undeserved. Do you see the difference? See, this is why we've got to work at this. This is why we've got to think through this a little bit. I don't love Jesus like I love Gina. I love Gina greatly and my human love strengthened by my walk with Jesus and so forth. And there's grace and mercy and forgiveness because I too have been forgiven. And, and, and if you're struggling in your marriage, you better think about that real quickly. The Bible tells us that we are to forgive like we have been forgiven. That's a, a little plug there. But when we love Jesus, we don't love him because he needs grace from us. He's perfect. 
He's infinite worthy of our love. He's, he's perfect in every way. He is love not in spite of something. He's love because of who he is. And think about when we have a full understanding of Christ in direct proportion to my understanding of who I am without him, there now becomes a spirit-driven, a truth-driven love for the Lord Jesus. And this love for Christ encourages my soul now, and it greatly affects my obedience because I received the love I did not deserve. And now I can return to him just a pouring out of affection and worship towards the Lord. And look, if you understand who Jesus is, and what the Father has given you in his Son and in his love, that truth will set you free. And you can love in the most difficult circumstances. You want to love in hard circumstances? You want to love when someone fails you? You want to love when, when you have something coming into your life that you did not foresee? You give that to God. You come to Christ, not giving him anything, not saying, I'm going to be gracious to you. I'm going to love you because you are, you are deserving of love. It'll help you love the unlovable. Hmm. I think this means that the love of Christ is we respond to his glory. We respond to his beauty. I want to see the I want to re-see the scene of Peter, James, and John in the Mount of Transfiguration. As they saw the veil drop and see uh, the transformative glory of Christ. Man, they're building booths. They're, they're doing everything they would to honor God when they were in his presence. And to show you how weak our love can be, if it isn't generated from God, they walk off the mountain and argue about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Listen. We got to rely on the God-generated love. Jesus is pleasurable, brothers and sisters. He's infinitely desirable. You honor him because he's infinitely worthy. You treasure him because he's infinitely valuable. You enjoy him to the utmost. That's what he wants from us. And that all comes down to, listen, this question, are you satisfied in him or are you looking for another? Are you satisfied in Jesus? I think this is the reaction of a Christian whose heart of stone has been removed. The souls have been awakened from the dead. You didn't just breeze into Christianity. You just didn't decide, well, I think I'll be a Christian today. It was a predetermined plan of God, and it's radical. Right. You've got to get that through our heads. It's radical. I now love where I could not love before. I have a storehouse of treasures with my Lord and Savior. And when and if he wants to give them, he'll do them in his perfect will. I love him. See, this separates us. Separates us from the world. Loving, listen, loving Jesus is not doing things in the matter of excellence. I, I, I think we have to be careful there. I think we do excel still more. Paul challenges the church to keep running. Um, this, is a, this is a laborsome life. You strive. Agonazzo is used over and over about our life. We strive. We run. It's a battle. It's, it's finishing races. It's all of those things. But listen, brothers and sisters, it's not getting, him through, getting to him through our excellence. It's through his excellence that causes us to worship. Now, just a reminder. In John chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus says, Men love darkness rather than light. Did you see that this week? Did you see that even closer to home? Jesus says, Men love darkness rather than light. And is Jesus not called the light of the world? This is the problem, the state of the world. The Father shows us how the love of the Son works. John chapter 3, verse 35, the Father loves the Son, and listen to this, and has given all things into his hands. And, and you remember when his baptisms and his transfigurations, I've already mentioned this, but the Father speaks, right? The clouds part, the voice of God comes, and he says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. He says that several times. Baptism, trans, uh, uh, transfiguration, 
I'm well pleased. So as I thought about that, I go, that's the kind of love that the Father gives us, is we're pleased with Jesus. What he gives, what he doesn't give sometimes. We're pleased with him. See, the Father's showing us the love he has for the Son and the love he gives us to love him. We're pleased with him. No matter what he does, what he doesn't do, we're pleased with him. Are you pleased with Jesus right now? Or are you frustrated with him because he didn't answer your prayer the way you want it? Or he's allowed something in your life that's challenging? Are you pleased with him? See, when we just throw comments, and I know I, I talked about it so much, love Jesus, love his word, love his people. Those are big statements, aren't they? When you start to dive into the depth of what God says. Piper, in his Piper-esque way, says it this way. We are to feel pleasure in him, to esteem and admire and enjoy and treasure and stand in trembling, happy awe of him as we give all things to him as the Father gave all things to him. Do you love Jesus? Well, yeah, but I don't know about give all things. It was a defining moment for the rich young ruler, wasn't it? Do you love me? Well, you want me to give all that up? He went away distraught. What if he asked for everything from you right now? Would you give it to him? Is he worthy of it? See, the command comes to mind here. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments in verse 15. If you're born again, you'll treasure Jesus. You'll receive him. You'll believe in him. John chapter 6, you'll, be, you'll consume him. You'll take him in. You'll, you'll treasure him. You'll sell fields. You'll sell whatever to get that treasure. He, he's everything to you. You find him wonderful and trustworthy. See, that's what it means to love Jesus. Fourth, what does the Father promise for those who love his son. This last question answers what the Father and I think Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity here, promised to those who love his son. Remember, in just in a few hours he's going to die. This has a place in time and it's important. But the sum of the promise is that the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the Trinity will be with you forever. That, that's the focal point of this. And yet I see seven quick promises I want to walk you through. Verse 16, number one. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. <laughs> I think that's fascinating. You want to you know what the promises of the Father is for those who love the Son? Well, here's one. He's going to give you another helper. That means it's not the Father, it's not the Son, it's somebody else. It's who? Those who die, deny the Trinity, I just don't know. They say, well, the Trinity is not used. The word Trinity is not used in the Bible. Oh, my goodness. It's all through the Scriptures. They do everything together. And here the, the Bible tells us, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another. So it's not the Father. It's not the Son. It's, it's got to be the Spirit. Jesus happens to be the first helper, right? Because he says the word another. I think that's important. Do you see that in your Bible? He'll give you another. So Jesus is, is the, the helper. He's a helper, I would say. There's no, listen, there's no greater word used of helper. I was teaching this somewhere this week or heard this. Um, um, the word helper is used about God more than anyone else. So ladies, in Genesis chapter 2 where it says that he's going to provide a wife for Adam to be a helper, don't, don't, don't look down on that. That word is used of God more than anybody else. And so here, look at the gift of God. I'm going to give you a helper so it's not Jesus, it's not the Father, but Jesus is the first helper. He came to help them understand the Father. And this is just remarkable. And when Jesus returns to heaven, the Father is going to give the Holy Spirit and he's going to help them. There's your promise. And when you come to know Jesus with your personal Savior, he puts his own spirit within you. Ha! Can you ask for anything more than that? Don't sequester, don't, don't sequester it. Verse 17, promise number two, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him because it, he abides with you and will be with you. So the help of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. That's, that's good, right? That is, he will help you 
by opening your heart and your mind to this glorious truth of the love of the Father and the finished work of Jesus, that's a great promise. And you should pray, Lord, for your lost children and lost family members and people you know. Oh, Lord, help them see you. That means you're going to have to give them a love for Jesus and you're going to have to give them your spirit so they'll see you. The illuminating work of the spirit. That's a gift from God. You have the illuminating work of the spirit. And he'll abide in you and I'll be in there. And you, so you have this Trinitarian work residing within us. Oh, what a great promise. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Well, not only will the Holy Spirit come, but the Bible says Jesus is the first person right here, singular. I, I, Jesus, will come to you. And, and think about what orphans need. They need perfect, uh, protection. They need um, provision. Um, they need leadership. Um, they need all those things, right? And so that's what Jesus comes and Jesus will be all that and even more, and, and he, he won't leave you. You know, you're a bunch of orphans, aren't you? Spiritually speaking, you were. And now you are the family of God. What a great promise. 19, fourth promise. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live and you will live also. On well, three days... Jesus says, after I die, I will rise from the dead, and I'm not going to start my ministry over again on this world, on this earth again like I did before, but I'm going to appear to you. He's talking now directly to the disciples. I'm going to show you I'm resurrected. You'll see me, and I'm going to assure your hearts of my bodily resurrection, and you'll know it's me because you can drive your fingers in my hands or my side, and you'll know that I live, and because I live, you live. There's your next promise. We don't die. Our heart might stop breathing, uh, beating. We might lose our breath. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There is no death for believers. He's promising them that. Fifth promise. Verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Oh, goodness, brothers and sisters. Talk about assurance here. I, I'm going to give you assurance First of all, it's going to start with this. The Father and I are equal. The Father does, I do. What the Father says, I say. He's talking about that all the way through the book of John. And that you and I now are bound together because I'm in you and you're in me. That's our position in Christ and there's no greater gift of assurance that Christ is in us. We stand in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. You think you can lose your salvation? What kind of nonsense is that, that that makes its way through our churches? That's a, that's a direct rejection of the finished work of Christ and his promise to indwell us. Hmm. I could sit on that for a while, but let's move on. Six, into verse 21. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and disclose or manifest myself to him. And so he is saying here, my father and me, we, we are going to have a very special, very close, family-like love for you. And we're going to show ourselves, we're going to reveal ourselves to you. And, and then we're going to show you things about us that the world's never going to see. Oh, you people right here. You have seen such amazing things because you believe Jesus, you love him, and you believe your Bible, and you love one another that those folks over there have never, never seen. You are privileged but are you hiding that light under a bushel? I mean, we, we are so privileged. He's shown us these things. This is his promise. Uh, oh, do you remember when you came to know Christ and you're reading the Bible? <laughs> and you look and you go, whoa! That's me in the scriptures he's dying for. He's thinking of me. He's given me the big ability to forgive like he forgave. I am pardoned. I no longer get what I deserve, and you just become overwhelmed. See, that's what I say. Have you, have you lost your amazement at grace? Oh, if you have, brother, sister, beg for God to give it back. Go get right with him. And you'll watch him do amazing things. Seventh, verse 23, and he's responding 
to the question asked by Judas, not Iscariot, and he makes that very clear in verse 22. Lord, what has happened? There, uh, what, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And so Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word in verse 23, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode, make our abiding, make, make our residence in him. And, and think about that. Is that not, and I, you're going to struggle with this a little bit, but hang on here. Is that not kind of heaven on earth? Father and the Son, he says, plural, we. Will we not make our abode in that person? Wow. Heaven, in a sense, has come to my internal being. The word abode is such an amazing word. Amane is the word, yeah. It, it's only used one other time in the book of John. It's found in verse 2. He says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. It's the same word, right? Same Greek word. So he's dwelling. He, the Father and the Son are dwelling within us. Through the, through the illumination and the work of the Holy Spirit, he, he abides within us. If I were not so, I wouldn't have told you, he says. So he's gone to prepare a place in heaven for us, but he's prepared a place right here. We talked about this, oh, I don't know, quite a while back, and I was in John chapter 14 on a Wednesday night, and, and we talked about what the, the building that he's been doing within our, internally in us. But see, the result of this promise that he promises to abide in us is that what happens is we'll keep his word. Believers walk with Jesus according to the word because the Father has caused them to love the Son. That's what we do it. If you're here for any other reason, repent of it. Tell the Lord, I'm here for the wrong reasons. I want to love your Son. Is this the Christ you love? Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that you certainly undeserved on our part, gave us a love for your son. Hmm. It never gets old, Lord. You pardoned our sins. You forgave us. You removed them. You choose never to bring them up. We're the blessed people on earth. And then you take residency in our lives, Lord, so that we'll never be lost. We'll never feel alone. You are always with us, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what's happened to us. You reside within us, and that is truly a tremendous treasure. And I ask, Lord, that through the knowledge of the word that we've received today, that we would love your Son. Not because he needs anything from us, not in an act of grace us towards them, but to know that he is purely lovable. And Lord, I pray this will change us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, it's always great to uh, respond to what we've heard in God's word. So I want to invite you to stand as we sing of just the love of God, of how he loves and cares for us. <clears throat> The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the highest hell. The guilty pair Bow down with care. God gave His Son to live. His erring child, He reconciled in pardon from His sin. On earth a quill And every place
standing for our closing benediction. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son and causing us to need him and love him. Thank you that you have made yourself at home in us. This love for your Son and your abiding in us drives our obedience and our desires to live according to your word. We thank you for the overflowing nature of your love poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We are now no longer orphans, but we are protected and loved and provided for as you lead us by your spirit. Now, Lord, may we go and live for the one who loves us and abides in us. In Jesus' name, amen.